Despite the intense labor battles and growing public scrutiny resulting from the strikes of 1960 and 61, many of the old problems facing Toronto's residential construction workers and their unions persisted. At the base of these problems was the fact that unionized contractors kept defaulting on their collective agreements in order to compete with cheaper, non-unionized business rivals. The Brandon Union Group's chief strategist, Charles Irvine, tried to consolidate their so-called victories by picketing one construction company at a time. The Bricklayers Local 40 and the Laborers Local 811, who had collective agreements with their respective contractors, grew tired of being regularly asked to walk out of jobs in solidarity with their allied locals. And so did their employers' association, which gave them an ultimatum in the summer of 1962 when renewing their agreement. Either abandon the Brandon Union Group or forfeit their negotiations. By then, the charismatic organizer Bruno Zanini, who had previously been shunned by the labor establishment, was working for the Laborers International Union as a consultant and conciliator for Ontario and Manitoba. According to him, the Laborers' executives in Washington wanted him to break away from the Brandon Union Group and cancelled Local 811's charter, instructing Zanini to re-sign those men under a different local. In the fall of 1962, those two locals, representing about 2,000 workers, split from the Brandon Union Group, prompting its collapse soon afterwards. The decision caught Irvine by surprise, who felt betrayed by his sidekick. After the formidable duo broke apart, Zanini became estranged from his mentor, but also from the rank-and-file workers due to the demanding traveling responsibilities and unhealthy amount of stress that came with his new job. Behind him were the days of the Brandon Hall and Lansdowne Theatre, where hopeful and excited crowds grabbed onto his every word projected from the stage, and twice carried him on their shoulders. But in Zanini's case, the past was never far behind. In December 1963, his criminal past caught up with him, when he and two men that he had hired as bodyguards were arrested while parked outside of a house in Forest Hill. Zanini, the driver, was charged with possession of burglary tools. He was fired from his union job immediately after this. Two years later, after a first mistrial, Zanini was sentenced to 16 months in jail. The Toronto Building Trades Council, which represented international union locals, primarily in the industrial, commercial, and institutional construction sectors, or ICI, tried to fill the void left by the Brandon Union Group and created a residential construction division in the spring of 1963. They were able to sign up the majority of workers in various trades, but ultimately failed to certify them because of the sheer complexity of their employment arrangements. Eventually, the council gave up. In the summer of that year, the Building Trades Council lost one of its residential union locals, Zanini's former Bricklayers Local 40. After internal turmoil, the new Secretary General, John Mayorin, decided to break away from the international unions and form an independent, Canadian-based bricklayers' union. Meanwhile, the Laborers Local 183 continued to expand its heavy construction agreements and job classifications included in its jurisdiction, along with its membership. In March 1964, they went on their first full strike, together with the operating engineers and the Teamsters, to demand higher wages from sewer and water main contractors. Three years later, Local 183 went on strike again, but this time by themselves. In both instances, the young Italian-Canadian organizer John Stefanini led them into victory. When Stefanini officially became Local 183's business manager in 1969, he slipped comfortably into a role that had been partially tailored by his ongoing leadership. 1964, I was in charge of the first strike of Local 183. Unfortunately, I had to direct the strike because Jerry was in the hospital and uh, Rally, Mike Raleigh was went to Harvard University. I was 23, so uh, Mike said to me, call the boys and call, tell them to go on strike. I didn't have the time. So I printed pamphlets all over the jobs and said, on Monday morning, come to the office, you're on strike. And much to my surprise, everybody showed up. And that was a very important lesson to me because it taught me to have faith on the members, on the workers. In 67, 
I ran the strike again because unfortunately Jerry was sick in the hospital. It was a tough and long strike. We did the opposite in Irvine and Zanini. We did not send out flying squads. We only used two members picket. And we told them to cooperate with the police. As a matter of fact, we were telling the police where the pickets were. In 1960, 61 strike, there were a lot of people that were arrested. And it was a strike that uh, did not succeed. I personally was sentenced to six months in jail for obstructing police, which is not true, but this was the charge. After I got six months, everybody was scared to go out on the picket line. And the strike collapsed. When I ran the strike myself, never one person was arrested. And the strike was just as big. Why? If you obey by the law, you don't have any problem. I think Jerry was a very honest person. I think he came to realize that the person who acted as manager was me. Running the strikes, negotiating, organizing, that is the job of the manager. You see, we had a great deal of respect for Jerry. It was Jerry that decided to give me the title. We, I did not ask, or there was no pressure was ever on Jerry to give the title to anybody else. He was considered like um, a business manager of Beritus, even if he was only the president. As older union leaders withdrew into the background, new ones stepped forward, like Agostino Simoni. Born in Pescara, Italy, Gus Simone moved to Canada in 1954, where he learned the lathing trade in the apartment building field. After rising to the rank of foreman, he tried his luck in the U.S. for a short period, then returned to Toronto, where he finally settled in 1965. Facing the same old jungle, Simone set out to unionize his fellow tradesmen under the Wood, Wire, and Metal Lathers International Union. In about eight months, he was able to do what others had failed by organizing several lathing companies under his newly chartered Local 562. By 1968, Simone had become the sole supplier of residential lathers in Metro Toronto, a powerful position that he would leverage to enrich himself and a group of subcontractors involved in an illegal bidding ring. Much of the chaos that befell Toronto's residential construction industry in this period resulted from technological innovations that threatened to displace long-established trades and disrupt their craft-based union structures, while also creating new demands for organizing vulnerable workers in this booming city. One of these innovations was drywall. First introduced in commercial construction in the 1940s, drywall, or gypsum board, came to dominate the residential sector during the high-rise apartment building boom in the mid-1960s, given the fact that it was prefabricated, cleaner, faster to install, and ultimately cheaper than traditional methods that employed two unionized trades, plasterers and lathers. The first of those trades was controlled by Charles Irvine, the Vice President for Canada of the Operative Plasterers and Cement Masons International Union. The imposing Scotsman saw the writing on the wall for his proud trade and for his own position as a major labor broker. So he fought drywall in the only way he knew how, by deploying his tried and true aggressive tactics, which only pushed developers further into adopting drywall. Lathing companies had no problem transitioning to drywall, but not the unions, which engaged in jurisdictional battles over the right to represent drywall workers. Lathers, plasterers, carpenters, and painters all claimed to be best positioned to organize these men, most of whom were paid on a piecework basis. Recognizing the threat and the opportunity presented by this new trade, in 1969, Simone set out to organize these workers in the residential sector by himself. Irvine, who had been a mentor to Simone and had counted on his lathers union to ward off drywall and revive plastering and lathing, was incensed by Simone's decision 
to go at it alone. Another major technological innovation in Toronto's residential construction industry was concrete forming. This new building technique replaced the more costly steel and brick, along with the skilled tradesmen they employed. In their place, cheaper, semi-skilled carpenters built wooden forms for the concrete to be poured in. Rod setters laid iron rods to reinforce the concrete, crane operators hoisted the concrete buckets, cement finishers smoothed over the concrete after the pour, and laborers performed various supportive tasks. Well, good for business, this technique was not safer than previous ones. The time and money that it saved contractors and developers still came at a very high cost to a great many number of workers, who suffered disabling and sometimes fatal accidents under its dangerous working conditions. When I started, it was all pretty well wood, really. Uh, two by fours, four by fours, and so forth. When you used to fly your panels out, I mean, material used to be falling like crazy on, on the floors, so or you had to pick it up, bring it up, and so forth. In those days, we didn't have a harness, where today you have a full harness where the rope uh, catches you. Ours was strictly like a belt, and uh, you could only go maybe <laughs> hook it up to a, you know, to a piece of two by four and walk maybe about uh, uh, not even 10 feet, and then you had to unhook it and, and hook it back on. Sometimes people used to take uh, chances because they didn't want to get, uh, you know, uh, laid off or fired. Uh, and then you always had another person that would do it. In case you didn't want to do it, there was always somebody there to do it. So people, a lot of them were scared. Falls, broken legs, uh, arms, scratches and so forth. Uh, but uh, the worst one was when that, uh, just before Christmas, when the person, uh, uh, a form hit him on the head and uh, he got paralyzed from the, you know, from the neck down. So there were accidents, no question about it. I mean, other jobs that I heard uh, be, that I wasn't working there, that uh, there had to be accidents, uh, you know, people that did get killed, uh, where scaffolds probably came down. But it was construction in those days, that's how it was. Uh, you know, uh, we were immigrants, uh, you know, and some of them didn't even speak English. You know, it was always a thing, so they were scared. I mean, they had a family to take care of, so they would do stuff that you wouldn't do today. People would line up on the, on the gate. If you need work, so you just choose. I was a foreman, so you can see that if you have any, a little bit of experience, come in, yeah. And if they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't make it in the afternoon, they're gone. People were afraid to lose the job, and they took chances, they jumped, they, they, they don't secure properly the panel, especially the panel was, with the wind uh, was really terrible. It was really no safety, no, no protection, no nothing. Then Nick Di Lorenzo came around with good ideas. Uh, he didn't do it for the good of the people, but good for the good of the business. And the flight form came, and that was able to eliminate a lot of work and have Speeding, and then the aluminum came out, which is now is still in full swing now. Now everything is aluminum and fly form and everything. The most significant new building technique to emerge in the 60s, which made possible the mass production of Toronto's high-rise apartment buildings, was flying form. This new method of concrete forming consisted of using lightweight metal structures that could be hoisted with a crane to the next floor where they were easily reassembled including large sliding table-like forms where concrete was poured to create the floor slabs. High-rise apartment developers loved this cost-cutting innovation because it sped up construction greatly, was easily replicated, and allowed for standardized floor plans. The Italian immigrant Nicola Di Lorenzo is credited with having invented this technique. Like many of his countrymen, Di Lorenzo started out as a residential construction laborer after arriving in Toronto at age 17. A few years later, in 1958, he became a millionaire after founding his first concrete farming company with his two brothers. Di Lorenzo quickly became a much sought after contractor in Metro Toronto, where high rise apartment builders sought to reduce their project's massive upfront costs. Besides coming up with the idea of flying form and importing the cranes from Europe that made it possible, Di Lorenzo's other major cost-cutting innovation was his composite crew, which replaced five distinct trades, each with their own unions, with a new type of non-unionized semi-skilled worker 
that combined all of the various aspects of the job. In the past, uh, there was a craft union for every trade. Carpenters, just for carpenters, some finisher, for some finisher, electrician, just for electrician, and so on and so forth. However, the uh, development of the construction industry, they create a number of modified threads, like in the concrete forming. In the traditional ICI sector, each of these threads are strictly work that belongs to the threads. But Di Lorenzo used them as it was needed. So a carpenter would do laborers' work or vice versa. On top of that, in the ICI, the reinforcing steel, the road, is done by specialized company. So a concrete form in the ICI has to wait for them to install the roads or fini finish the concrete before proceeding. Di Lorenzo instead did himself all of that without using this subcontractor. And he really speed up the construction of the concrete forming. But he broke all the, tra all the um, pattern that was established in the craft union. In 1965, the Toronto Building Trades Council, which represented the five trades in residential concrete forming, launched a campaign to organize this new field under its Council of Forming Trade Unions. But after three years, they were only able to sign a small number of forming contractors. The big game in the high-rise apartment building jungle remained on the loose. Di Lorenzo was by far the largest player in this budding industry, employing about 60% of all forming workers in the late 60s. By then, his market share had been reduced by emerging competitors, some of them his former employees, whom Di Lorenzo accused of stealing his ideas and some of his best workers. As usual, developers took advantage of this competition by carrying on with their unethical open bidding practices, again creating an unsustainable race to the bottom among contractors. In order to outbid his competitors and maintain his dominance in the forming industry, Di Lorenzo had to keep wages very low which meant keeping unions out of his companies. For this, he hired the private detective Norman Menezes, whose tasks included weeding out union-friendly employees and performing other, more sinister union-busting tactics. Besides the very low wages and lack of job protection, the absence of unions in Di Lorenzo's work sites also allowed him to neglect costly safety standards, resulting in almost daily accidents, some of them fatal. In one incident alone, on May 23, 1968, at a Di Lorenzo apartment building project on Winford Heights and Don Mills, three laborers were crushed by a 2,600-pound concrete form panel that tipped over with the wind as they were having their lunch break. For two hours, their bodies went unnoticed as work continued, until one man, as he bent down to pick up a tool, noticed a foot of one of the victims sticking out from under the form. Nick Di Lorenzo was a very, very smart businessman, uh, in a way. He was hiring people from the, from the station as they arrive uh, from uh, the boat to the Union Station. He would send somebody there to hire them. At the peak of his uh, uh, career, he was employing 3,000 foreign workers, building high-rise buildings in Toronto and in, Os in Ottawa as well. At that time, the Building Trade Council uh, they moved, they want to launch a campaign to organize the farming industry because that was one trade that was still in the jungle. And local 506, our union, hired me to go and organize the laborers working for the farming. But n being confronted with such a, a, I hate to say the word ignorance, but it was the diffidence, the, the don't trust. I concluded that <coughs> these people need more education. I convinced some other union to help me to sponsor a radio program. Oggi è la festa del lavoro, 
Migliaia di operai, membri delle unioni, hanno festeggiato oggi. The radio program was called the voice of labor. And it was in two right con right away. Every union wanted to join in. We had about 14 unions paying for it. There was always somebody at the, the office uh, on Beverly, where the Italian consulate is now. There used to be La Casa d'Italia. I had an office there. And we met every week, every Wednesday, to determine the program and try to get the, the equal share of air share, uh, time to everybody uh, and uh, participating. And, and appeal, keep appealing to the, to the workers to call us uh, and and that's what we did. They were phoning in, we'll go then, meet them in their houses, sign them up, and everything. Unfortunately, uh, one time, I decided to go and see my, my people uh, in Italy. And uh, so I gave, I gave the, the program to run by a, a, a steel workers from the, U, the United Steel Workers Union. He was a radical, uh, and he, was, he must have really been nailing uh, Nick Di Lorenzo and his farming industry. Because uh, at one point when I came back, I received a, a, a notice from the police that, that there were some hods been hired by Nick Di Lorenzo to come and beat me up. And, uh, I went to court. Uh, I was even sitting in the same waiting room with the guys that were supposed to, to give me the... But nothing happened, and there was nothing uh, conclusive, no, no proof, nothing. I had, nobody touched me, so there was just nothing. It was nevertheless something, like I still left the paper, who he, he, was, he was supposed to have hired these goons, to beat me up and also to beat up an, a competitor, form uh, worker, uh, contractor. It didn't, didn't sound too good for me because I knew that he was, if anybody, for instance, the church, uh, St. Alphonse, uh, needed some repair, he would send the people to do the job for them, for, for free. I was once, uh, I was organizing a group of Boy Scouts coming from the States. I was go going to r find a way to take all these Boy Scouts to visit the high point of Toronto. I didn't know who to turn. I called Nick De Lorenzo. What do you know? He sent me the, a bus. It's like a school bus, and the driver. See, all day. So that, that's uh, the kind of guy he was. In 1968, the Council of Forming Trade Unions was outmaneuvered by Gus Simoni. Despite the fact that there was no lathing work in concrete farming, and therefore no jurisdiction for the Lathers Union, Simone was able to create a concrete farming division within his local 562 and sign up most of the farming workers. One of the reasons behind Simone's success was none other than Bruno Zanini. After being released from jail, Zanini tried to return to his first passion and worked for a short time as a singer in a small suburban hotel but his greater talent for organizing Italian workers was much too valuable, and he soon found himself back in the heart of Toronto's construction labor battles, this time working under Simone. Much to Zanini's surprise, he found that his former associate, Charles Irvine, who was still a member of the Forming Council, was funding this campaign. Under the Lathers Local 562, Zanini was able to sign up the Forming workers with relative ease, since many of the men that he had organized in the 50s and early 60s were now foremen who helped him spread the word. Here come Charlie Irvine and Bruno Zanini. Bruno comes out from jail. Irvine, who was very close to Gus Simone of the Lather, convinced Gus to hire Bruno to organize the concrete forming. What did they have to offer to the concrete forming contractors? One union, which was very appealing to the employer. Second, worker conditions were below those established by the Council of Concrete Forming. They just called the people, the workers, to a meeting and together with the employers, and they signed up all of them and they signed a collective agreement. 
but they didn't do it the legal way like I did, company by company, worker by worker, I signed up the slow but legal way. I remember all this mass of people that they were interested to get organized, but they couldn't decide. They were waiting for the, own, the owner to say, yes, let's get organized. And uh, I used to tell him, I said, well, what do you expect? The owner going to defend you? I mean, so at that time that we were going to this meeting, it was, it was every Sunday in so summer, 65, 66, 67. So I attend one meeting one day, one, one Sunday, at the, this theater on Lansdown and Blue Street. Prunzarini was in charge. Like, so he was a great speaker. Making all this argument and people asking this and that, I said, but... So then I intervened and I was in, among the crowd and intervened and says, but do you want to be organized or you don't want to be organized? Because if you want to be organized, you have to listen to the guy. I, after the meeting, I got called by Bruno and he says, listen, look like you're interested in this organization. I mean, to be... He says, yes, I'm interested. I, would you try to be an organizer for three months for us? I says, uh, let me talk to because I, I have commitment with the company. Uh, I have a crew to look after, you know, you just cannot leave it like that. Well, okay. So I talked to, to, to my company and he says, you do what you have to do. Anyways, after a couple of weeks, I went with Bruno. He, we had a little office on Eglinton and Van Road. And uh, he gave me this book and he said, go around and sign people to... Zanini was a catalytic. He's the guy that, I don't know if he could deliver, but he was able to bring all these people and give hope to them. The main hurdle for Simone and Zanini was Di Lorenzo. Without his group of companies being unionized, the smaller contractors would never bargain, since the increased labor costs would make it impossible for them to compete with Di Lorenzo. But after multiple discussions, Simone convinced the Italian contractor that sooner or later his companies would be unionized, and that his best option was to accept his offer, which included an unprecedented five-year agreement that froze wages and guaranteed no strikes, and that classified farming work as a single flexible trade instead of the five rigid crafts of the Council of Forming Trade Unions. The International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 793, a council member that represented crane operators, switched sides and joined Simone's campaign at this point with its president, Frank Giles, leading the negotiations with Di Lorenzo. Not only did Di Lorenzo agree to this so-called sweetheart deal, he instructed his foreman, Big John Dalimonte, to organize his company workers into local 562's forming division. It only took him half a day to sign all crane operators. The remaining workers signed soon afterwards. All that Dalimonte had to do was threatened to fire anyone who did not join the union. Once Di Lorenzo was on board, the other contractors followed suit, and on November 4, 1968, they signed a five-year agreement with Simone's Lathers local. Only three forming contractors did not sign. Two of them Di Lorenzo's main competitors, Aurelio Bianchini and Kiriakos Vlahos, who signed instead with the forming council, given Di Lorenzo's influence over Simone's union. After some turmoil in the industry, the Forming Council challenged Simone's sweetheart deal in the Ontario Labour Relations Board on the grounds that the Lathers Local 562 lacked jurisdiction. The board agreed, and the deal was voided. Aware about all of this, I made a grand entrance. Why did I do it? My dream was to build a big, strong union. I understood the stronger and the bigger was the union, the better services I could provide to the members. I saw a golden opportunity to talk to Gas about it. Gas knew he couldn't hold it any longer, too much pressure. At that time, we were already representing a number of tribes. We were not strictly the so-called common laborers union. We had many trades already. We went to Washington. I called the general president. And uh, there was a meeting in Chicago. 
I brought down our lawyer. Gas Simone came down with his lawyer. Nick De Lorenzo came down. So all the parties were represented. And also the general president of the Lather Union. And we had a very frank discussion. And it was agreed that we, one of the three, would sign up each uh, workers working in the concrete forming, not transfer. So it was up to them if they wanted to join. The last international, we gave up jurisdiction to represent these people. Both employers were in agreement. We would hire the representative that Gassimone had, including Bruno, Bruno Zanini, and we would start a new organizing donate the proper legal way. Came back from Chicago, Bruno doesn't show up. I called Bruno and said, Bruno, how come you're not here? I know nothing about it, he said. But then Gas tells you, no, he told me nothing. The following Sunday there was a membership meeting uh, of the concrete forming, called by Bruno. Charlie Irvine goes to this meeting and the thunder from the stage, the soldier in Chicago like cattle. Believing they would be introducing themselves to local 562's forming workers, Gallagher and Stefanini went to this meeting on June 1st, 1969, only to find the doors of the Lansdowne Theater closed to them. Inside, about 1,400 men, most of them De Lorenzo's employees, rejected Local 183's proposal as conveyed by Simone and voted in favor of creating an independent Canadian union called the Concrete Forming Workers Union. Zanini was made president of the executive, which included Di Lorenzo's foreman, Joe Dalimonte, and the former Labour's Local 506 organizer, Enzo Ragno. Irvine, who was still supporting Simone's Local 562, was also involved in the background. The next day, the rogue union launched a strike that stopped work on nearly all high-rise apartment building sites across Metro Toronto. The contractors eventually capitulated and recognized Zanini's union as the bargaining agent for their farming workers and agreed to negotiate a three-year contract, which included higher wages and shorter hours than Simone's sweetheart deal. We paralyzed the whole Toronto high-rise building. We stopped all construction. Nobody worked because we want number one, respect. They was treat us like a slave, okay? No break time. Just to lunch, we supposed to get half hour lunch. Probably was a 20 minutes lunch. Change room was worse than slave, special in winter time. When the cold was outside, no heat, inside the shack, no, no place to hang the clothes. The day after we used to go inside the shack, our, our clothes was froze, froze. We have to wear it to start the work. And nobody was do nothing. But who did that? The big Bruno Zanini, he the one who put us in the movement, you know. This became national news once the CBC began reporting on it. Other news outlets picked up the story, which Zanini framed as a battle between international or American versus Canadian unions, a narrative that fit a larger and older discussion among the Canadian labor movement and drew support from other national unions. But when questioned by a CBC talk show host, Zanini admitted that the problem was not about being part of an American-based union like the Lathers International, but that he resented being told by their head offices in Washington that he had to surrender the workers he had organized to the laborers, his former employer. Simone, who was also a guest on this TV panel, seconded Zanini's account of what had happened in Chicago and added that Gallagher should be thrown in jail for making what he called empty threats against the independent union. Zanini only made the statement to get out from under his responsibilities. 
he had signed an agreement which was a sweetheart deal, if ever I've seen one, five years, uh, uh, loan is, is very wrong in our estimation, and then it was illegal when he signed it, and when he was, when the men began to ask questions about it, and the men were quite confused about the whole thing, uh, he then made this wild statement about our organization wanting to, to, to buy the men into our organization. We never do that. We go to the men, we get them to sign cards, and if they want to be members, we do it in the democratic procedure as required. And um, uh, it was an any perhaps might operate in that manner. But we most certainly do not. What specific action are you planning? We're going to go out in the usual manner with loudspeaker trucks and leaflets and pamphlets and uh, visiting homes and, of course, we may take some uh, action with regard to ready mix not being accepted by our members, uh, anybody who supplies these people uh, with uh, ready mix. We may have to take this kind of drastic action, but certainly not violent. The Building Trades Council, led by Alex Main, sought a peaceful resolution to this conflict by offering to merge Zanini's independent union into the Council of Forming Trade Unions, which was to be jointly led by the two of them. Zanini reportedly agreed to this offer during what the press called secret discussions that involved major builders. However, Zanini's forming workers voted against this proposal, and talks between the two sides broke down. After this, the Council launched a series of illegal walkouts against contractors who employed Zanini's men in an effort to push out the rogue Canadian outfit. The larger plan was to organize the entire residential construction sector and abolish its separate locals, including Mayodine's Independent Bricklayers Union, Irvine's Plasterers and Cement Masons and Simone's Lathers Locals resisted this incursion and told their men to cross the Council's picket lines. The Teamsters Local 230, which represented about 850 cement truck drivers, was asked by the Council to honour their picket lines and boycott non-cooperative concrete forming contractors and ready-mix concrete suppliers. However, Teamsters drivers either did not receive or did not follow the instructions from their executive and continued to deliver cement mix to the city's many residential construction sites. This led to various confrontations between supposedly allied unions, quashing Gallagher's hopes that violence could be averted. That was the case on August 27, 1969, when 40 members of the forming council unions, led by Local 183's Michael Riley, picketed the ready-mix cement supplier Teske in North York as a way of protesting the Teamster's lack of solidarity. This time, the truck drivers refused to cross the picket line. Frustrated with this illegal work stoppage, the company's president, George Teske, tried to drive one of his trucks through the line and hit one of the council's picketers, who refused to move. Enraged, the strikers dragged Teske out of his truck and came close to beating him, if not for the quick intervention of his Teamster employees. The two sides nearly got into a physical fight before the police intervened. Around this time, according to John Dalimonte, someone set his car on fire overnight. The next evening, he claimed to have received a visit from Simone, who allegedly threatened and bribed him into leaving Zanini's union. At a public meeting the next day, August 31st, Dalimonte, the union's vice president, spoke in favor of the forming council and walked out, later joining the rival team. Big John had succumbed to the pressure but the results were not as intended, as Zanini's men remained loyal to him and deemed Delamonte a traitor. Shortly after this, the Lathers Local 562 also switched sides and joined the Forming Council, after a heated membership meeting in which Simone undemocratically decided to pull his men from their jobs without offering strike pay, which prompted questions from the workers on the floor about the whereabouts of their dues. Simone's desertion was the final nail in his rocky relationship with Irvine, whose locals held out against the council's pressure. Tensions were once again high on September 11th, outside the York Center Ballroom on Vaughan Road, when 300 members of Zanini's independent union, transported by Di Lorenzo's company buses, tried to invade the strike headquarters of the operating engineer's local 793, a forming council member. For nearly two hours, the two sides shouted at each other from across the narrow street until they dispersed. The Union warfare ended in mid-September, 
after the Building Trades Council reached an agreement with six high-rise apartment developers, which committed to only hiring subcontractors that had collective agreements with the Council's unions in seven different trades, none of which were involved in concrete farming or bricklaying. The developer's refusal to include concrete farming in this agreement was celebrated as a victory by Zanini, whose small independent union withstood a lengthy and well-funded assault by the international unions. But like all of Zanini's victories, this too was short-lived. The Ontario Labour Relations Board refused to certify his union's right to bargain since it didn't represent the majority of farming workers, as required by law. Running out of options, Zanini took his forming workers to the Canadian Union of Construction Workers Local 1, another independent yet certified union led by John Mayodin. For the first time in his troubled career, Zanini was finally able to bargain with contractors without having to go on strike. But in the fall of 1970, amidst negotiations with one of the largest forming contractors in Metro Toronto, the former chief coroner and now member of provincial parliament Morton Shulman Speaking under the immunity provided by the Legislative Chamber, accused Zanini of being involved with known Mafia elements from Hamilton. These allegations tarnished Zanini's already sullied reputation and scared away contractors from any bargaining table where he sat. Once again, Irvine emerged from the shadows and offered to take Zanini and his men under a new plasterer's local. The now 50-year-old Italian-Canadian organizer accepted his older ally's call to arms and gave it another shot at securing a contract for his loyal followers. In the spring of 1971, the Maverick duo was back. In response, the Building Trades Council expelled Irvine's four plasterers and cement mason locals from its organization. Alex Main, the council's business manager, declared open war on Irvine, whom he accused of being a dictator who sought to set up a new empire in the residential sector in order to push out drywall. Maine also sought to discredit Irvine in the eyes of Italian workers by pointing to an Ontario Labour Board decision concerning negotiations with a contractor in Windsor in 1960, where the Scotsman had imposed on that company not to have more than 50% of its workforce be of Italian origin. The many public blows took their toll on Irvine and Zanini, who failed to generate significant momentum after a few poorly attended meetings. Their once loyal Italian workforce had become distrustful of their once charismatic leaders and their maverick tactics. In part, this was because other more established and stable unions had opened their doors to immigrant workers, especially the fast expanding Laborers Local 183, whose young Italian-Canadian leader would prove to be a formidable strategist. We had one vote, the other, every time we put forward something, the other four voted against us. So I called the organizers that uh, I said, how come you're making, you're not making progress to organize the industry? And they said to me, because the workers don't trust our council. How are they right up below the one that Zanini has? I said, no, on the book, on the agreement, they are higher. Nobody lives up to the agreement. So I told them, go out on every job, get the name, the classification, the hourly rate, the project of everybody, and we're going to put a mechanic lien on a project to get a difference as per collective agreement. Mechanic liens on a project are extremely important because if there is one, the builders cannot get the financing. We go to the meeting, I'm told we cannot put a mechanic lien. I said, why? Because we told the concrete former contractor to pay what they wanted as long as they get a job. We were not aware of that. I got very upset. I said, collective agreement is a collective agreement. Yeah, but how are we going to fight Bruno? This is the only way. I said, no. I said, only way to fight Bruno is the legal way. And get our collective agreement respected. They laugh at me. So I said to them, fine. I'll give you an ultimatum. 
either you give us the administration of the council and we call the shot or we leave the council. And if we leave the council, we go out and organize everybody. They laugh at me. More or less, who are you? A young manager, know nothing about the country for me, think you organize the industry when we try for 10 years? Guess what? Six months I did it. By the fall of that year, we represent 100%. Building 183 was like a bricklayer putting one brick on top of the other, signing up one man, one worker after the other, not by mass organizing at the Charlie Irvine or the Bruno Zanini. The other way was like building a castle on the sand. Tony Spada show up and he come and talk to me. He says, listen, he says, uh, you have some experience on the phone work. He says, are you interested to work for 183? He says, you got nothing to lose anyways, he says. He says, John Stefanini want to talk to you. That was 1971. And, and John Stefanini says to me, listen, we have, uh, we got to do something for these people, these mass of people, because Zanini fell, Gassimon fell, local one fell too. The following day we signed it was on Scarlet and St. Clair, with Di Lorenzo, we signed over 50 people one day. And going on and back and forth every day for years, until we got the phone work all together. I signed over 2,000 people in two, three years there. Ste Stefanini, he went and every, every company we signed, we put an application of the Department of Labor to legally organ represent them. That's why it was a process, a long thing, but in the end, when you hold a piece of paper, it's legal, and you, you strike, it's legal. You was set up on a military like, and this and that, you know, that, but that's what he liked. But uh, he had a vision, and he had connection, and he, tro he was trusted. That's why he was able to, to bring all this, because if you say something, he deliver. I was visited the former contractors, one by one, Tell them, look at, we had to put a stop to this mess. If we had a fair playing field, everybody would be the job on a fair basis. Right now, you don't know what one pays and what doesn't pay, and, and everybody was tired of these fights. I think they trusted me. They did not stop our organizer. They did not help. And without the interference of the contractor, the well, local entity organizer were able to get the majority of the man. I got a call from Bruce Benning, a very well-known lawyer, who said to me, why did you organize Meridian? Meridian at that time was the second largest builder in Toronto. I didn't even know who was Meridian. I said, Bruce, we are out to organize concrete forming, all concrete forming. And he said to me, but we are not concrete forming. We are builders. He arranged a meeting with uh, the owner, Max Merker. Max was known as the beast, tough. And he said to me, look, at, I'm not against union, but I don't want to be the only one. I said, fair enough, Max. So I got a quick lesson about the industry. I found out there was Greenwing, uh, Meridian, Belmont, Del Soto, a few others, no? I said to the representative, go and organize them. But the biggest surprise came when I got a call from Harold Green, who said, let's have breakfast. Harold was known to be very tough, very mean. I was reluctant to go. We met at a bagel place up on Wilson and uh, Bathurst. After a few niceties, he asked me a question. Who is calling the shot in 183? 
I said, Harold, I'm the manager. And he said, this is not the question I ask. Is a Gallagher? I said, look, at, I'm, I have the title and the authority and I do make decision. And you're looking the one who's calling the shot. Why? Jerry had the reputation of closing jobs down for safety. And the builders did not like that. See, at that time, a lot of people thought I had the title, but who really was calling the show was Rally or Gallagher, because I was completely an underestimated, which was very good. They don't watch your move. They look at somebody else. Harold Green invited me to a lunch. And here I found uh, a representative of the builders from Cadillac Fairview, Cambrock and Horse, the cream of the crop of the high rise builders. And they asked me all kinds of questions. They told me, look at, we want to deal with one honest union. No games. We are not against union. We want to put an end to the problems there. And we feel confident we can rely on you. So you can send your organizers. We are not going to tell our men to join, but we are not going to tell them not to join. I told the organizer to go out and organize as many builders as possible. And I, I spoke to each one of them, in particular Del Zotto, now Tridel, one of the largest. At that time it was Alvio, he was the president of the Ontario Liberal Party, who again, he assured me he was not against unions, and within the law they tried to help us out. Del Zotto, both, was both a builder and a concrete former contractor. Alvio de Zotto was a truly gentleman, a fair employer, who did not go out of way to organize our, his people, but he did not make it difficult. The agreement with the builders is very important because we were able to negotiate subcontractor clauses. The contracts they give to the bricklayers, to the carpenters, to the cement finisher, many others, they amount to thousands of workers. So having the subcontractor clause with the builder really was like a locking the industry for 183. The builders are the source. So if you control the source, you control everything else. On September 7th, 1971, Stefanini's Laborers Local 183 signed their first collective agreement with five of the largest high-rise apartment builders in Metro Toronto. With this contract, they came to represent practically all forming workers, becoming the largest residential construction union local in Canada and possibly North America. Local 183 would expand its clout in the 1970s and 80s by organizing concrete and drain, house basement, house framing, along with other construction fields. The combination of residential, industrial, and commercial sectors and multiple trades, totaling close to 6,000 members by 1974, turned Local 183 into the closest thing to an industrial union in Toronto's construction industry, previously dominated by the craft-based unions of the Building Trades Council. Its growing size and leverage allowed the union to set up a wide range of social services, welfare benefits, and one of Ontario's largest pension plans, an important asset for workers in a dangerous industry, even in the best of conditions. Local 183's growth reduced the intensity and regularity of the industry's labor management battles, but also gave rise to new and prolonged tensions with other construction unions that tried to protect their jurisdictions against the laborers' expansionism. The most significant feud would be with the United Brotherhood of Carpenters, including its residential local 1190, then led by Tony Iannuzzi and Gus Simoni. 
the latter having joined the Carpenters after they absorbed the Lathers local in 1979. But with new heights came new lows, where sinister characters of Ontario's criminal underworld moved in the shadows of contractors and union organizers. Zanini would be shot by unknown assailants in his underground parking garage. Their message was clear. Stop calling for a public inquiry into the construction industry. But the gunshot was louder than their message and was heard across the province, amplified at Queen's Park by the polemic MPP Morton Shulman and investigated by Judge Harry Weisberg, who led yet another royal commission that shed light on the infiltration of certain sectors of Toronto's building industry by organized crime figures. Weisberg's incriminating findings, published in December 1974, were the final blow for Irvine and Zanini, who retired from the labor movement afterwards. But while he stopped organizing, the opera singer did not stay mute and told the tenor of his life to someone who was willing to listen, as we will learn in the next episode.